Uh, Professor Anand Kumar was at the Center for the Study of Social Systems, JNU, and has been the former president of the Indian Sociological Society. He received higher education at BHU, JNU, and then completed his PhD from Chicago in 1986. He has taught formally at BHU and JNU from 1998 and informally mentored many of us, in fact, two to three generations. Uh, he coordinated the globalization course when we were students in JNU and supported many of our activities. Narratives of his student life has been legendary and motivated many of us. When we were student, he brought Dalai Lama there. So um, yeah, formally, he has also taught as India chair in Germany, Albert Ludwig University, at Humboldt University, at Tufts in 2013, in Austria, in Argentina, uh, in India. He has been at various places, Simla, at Neho, Kashmir University. Professor Anand Kumar is regarded as one of the finest political thinkers, a respected commentator, and having a distinguished career in political activism, starting with the popular JP movement. His works include State and Society in India, Nation Building in India, India, Chronic Poverty Report, Quest for Participatory Democracy, Tibet Source Book, and Understanding Globalization and Emerging India. His most recent book published by Sage is on political sociology of India. So, um, you know, the way uh, Professor Anand Kumar evokes and narrates social issues is mesmerizing. May I request you, sir, uh, for, for the inaugural road not today? Thank you. Uh, thank you, dear Dr. Aditya Rajji, for such a special introduction. It has put me in kind of a box where I must perform as per your description of my so-called qualities and output. For me, engaging with Bihar is going back to my student days because we learned about the strengths and weaknesses of Indian democracy through the laboratory called Bihar. It was the place where we saw the pathology of power in the form of JP movement in 1974, 75, and of course the emergency Raj we also saw the crisis of success of coalition politics, first in 67, 69, then 77, 80, and of course, for the last three decades, Bihar is an outstanding example of alternative discourse of power around politics of backward classes. The tensions of democratic politics in the form of mobilization versus institutionalization is all written all over Bihar's face. I must say that in this very special gathering, which gives an international focus for Bihar's scholarship, uh, I would like to put three uh, frames of analysis for your consideration, and they are still relevant. First is the politics of interest, which originates in Champaran movement 1917, the peasant question, the question of international political economy of agriculture, the colonial pattern, the post-colonial developments, et cetera, et cetera. Bihar has been the home of Indian Kisan movement, Indian peasant movement in the form of Kisan Sabha, the establishment of Congress Socialist Party in Patna in 1934 was no accident, and the post-colonial peasant mobilization ranging from the socialist and communist land distribution movement to Sarvode, to Naxalism, tells its own um, story in so many ways. So the first question is, how do we put Bihar's story in the frame of identity politics and interest politics? Interest politics, of course, takes us closer to the class paradigm, Marxist socialist approach. How far it is valid? where it is valid, where it has its own problems, has to be engaged. The second frame is the frame of internal colonialism. Bihar became part of the internal colonial syndrome during the second, third, and fourth fiber plan of India. It lost out to other rapidly growing parts of India, like Maharashtra, 
Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, to some extent, Bengal also, though later on Bengal became a close partner of Bihar and Orissa in deepening the story of chronic poverty and failed projects of uh, distributive justice. So the second frame for me, which holds good, is the frame of internal colonialism, which was perpetuation of some of the colonial laws, regulations, patterns in terms of sharing the national resources. And they always talked about the credit deposit ratio, how much money was collected by Bihar and how much was returned to Bihar through redistributive process called planning for development. The third frame, of course, which is the most prominent since 1990s, is the frame of identity politics. I also want to suggest that this identity politics is not simple vote bank politics. It is part of the dividends of democracy because it degenerated the framework created in 200 years of colonial discourse of power and created a new quest for identity which were democratic identities. The identities were around the power to vote. Identities were not only based upon dominant caste syndrome, they were also around political mobilization. So identity politics, which is the most dominant frame today, most important paradigm today, is rooted in the discourse of decolonization coupled with democratization. Democracy and decolonization together have written the background script or the, what you call, music notes, which is now in full calibration in places like Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. So as today is the day for Professor Jeffrey and uh, Santosh Singh Ji and a few other well-organized panel of discussions, I wish you great success because in the story of Bihar, when you want to look at caste, not much has been done systematically since the days of Professor Sachidanan, Narmadeshwar Prasad, and Sachidanan Sinha. When you look at the class pattern, you still refer to students for the book of classical work, but a little dated work of Arvind Narayan Das, Republic of Bihar. When you want to look at democratic upsurgence, democratic revival, democratic innovations, you go back to Bihar movement. Recently, a multi-volume study has come out, edited by a very senior sociologist, Professor Raymond Karna, about Bihar Andolan. But friends, Bihar Andolan was in 1974. Since then, much water has flown through the Ganga, and much metamorphosis has taken place of the champions of democracy in Bihar. They have become totally unrecognizable. If you look at them in 74 frame, and if you want to look at them in 2021 frame, you will not recognize them. Why? Because it has been a dynamic story of democratization, decolonization, and development imperatives. I welcome all those who are looking at Bihar. Otherwise, Bihar has been treated as too complex a story. Don't disturb Bihar. Let Biharis be in Bihar, and let others stay out of Bihar. That has been the song and theme of Indian social sciences for the last several years. I'm very happy that a new generation of concerned scholars is visiting Bihar, including many of the Bihar-born social scientists. And I'm very optimistic about the results of this series of lectures about developmental dynamics and the story of democracy in India. Thank you very much, Aditya. Thank you very much, all the scholars. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I will briefly introduce Jeffrey, and then we will get started with his lecture. Uh, Jeffrey Witzel is with the Department of Anthropology, Union College, New York. He has academic training from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and PhD from the University of Cambridge. He studies caste empowerment and national politics in Bihar. His research interests include the political economy of rural development in India. He has worked extensively on a critical rethinking of democracy and the post-colonial state through an examination of lower caste politics in India, where he has been engaged in ethnographic research since 2000. 
He's the author of the famous book. The reason I call famous is because you heard Professor Deepak, Professor Anand Kumar say that we don't have much work done in Bihar. So uh, this was published by the University of Chicago Press. This book uh, is interesting and it investigates the relationship between recent democratic mobilization and development oriented governance in India. It looks at the history of colonial uh, colonialism in India and the role in both shaping modern caste identities and linking locally powerful caste groups to state institutions. It discusses the rise of lower caste politics in one of India's, you know, developing and most popular state Bihar. Uh, let's listen to uh, Jeffrey. Over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you for being with us. You can share your slide if you want to. All right, let's see. How was how that? We, yeah. can, see we yeah. can see it, Jeffrey. It's good. Great. So thank you very much um, for inviting me. It's it's great. It's great to be here. Um, I want to thank um, Aditya, Papia, and 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 the moderators, Anand Kumar. Um, one of the reasons it's great to be here is yeah, I miss Bihar so much. This is literally the pandemic has caused the longest stretch that I haven't been in Bihar literally for 25 years, believe it or not. Um, it's also amazing, you know, that there's an IIT so close to my original field site uh, in Koyalwar. And so I, I know that area quite well. And in a way, this reflects the dramatic changes that have occurred in Bihar over the past two decades. So this talk, I'm going to focus not so much on, on my book, material. Um, I want to I want to focus on on the current project on activism around the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act in Bihar, uh, especially in Muzaffarpur district. Um, India's employment guarantee and one of the most ambitious global attempts to legislate an economic right. And I think examining the efforts of activists to organize laborers to collectively exercise rights I will argue, reveals a deep antagonism between the logics of rights and electoral politics in India. I, I'm going to attempt to unpack some of the dynamics of this antagonism and consider what this teaches us. In doing so, I move in the opposite direction of standard analysis, which begins with policy and then examines implementation. Um, what the rights framework allows, allows one to do is to begin from the bottom with efforts of laborers to collectively exercise rights and to examine resistance on the part of government officials, representatives, uh, political representatives, and the brokers through which they operate. Resistance to efforts to collectively exercise rights under Manrega reveals in stark relief, almost like a mirror, the actors and practices that subvert rights in everyday village life. So some of this will be about some of the limitations of this political change that's happened in Bihar over, over the last three, four decades. Um, Manrega provides 100 days of employment for every rural household in India, a universal legal right that only poor citizens have an interest in exercising, which is a so-called self-selecting design it's intended to be set in motion by laborers exercising their rights. Examining efforts to exercise this employment guarantee provides a window into the everyday life of law for the rural poor and reveals insights into the intersection of law and class within everyday life in contemporary India. So let me begin by, by briefly introducing Mahant Manyari 
uh, the principal village for this research in, in Muzaffarpur district and the headquarters for the Samaj Pariwartan Shakti Sangatan, locally known as Manrega Watch, the organization that was the, the focus, the case study for, for this research. This is the Manrega worksite actually, and this is uh, in Mahan Manyari. Mahan Manyari is a very large village with a population over, over 12,000 people. It's, it's not far from, from Muzaffarpur city. Uh, on both sides of a village road bordering this work site, and lined with several tea stalls where laborers uh, relax, smoke while sipping tea, there's nearly 600 laborer households in a patchwork of caste specific tolas. Manrega Watch's modest headquarters consist of a few mud, uh, mud, mud and thatched structures behind a supporter's house near the labor settlements, uh, not too far from here. At the center of Mahant Manyari's geography and history is, is, is the monastery, the, I think Mutt, a, a grand gated complex built in the colonial area that still re retains over 100 acres of land in trust, striking temples, and the palace like residence of the Mahant, from whom Mahant Manyari derives its name. The story of the Mahant lineage began, strangely enough, considering what it became with asceticism. Uh, the Mahants were originally Nagababa, sannyasis. Uh, ascetics who relinquish all earthly possessions, including their clothes. I was told by the father of the current Mahant that the founder of the lineage lived in a simple hut at the side of, of what later became uh, the monastery. But during the late colonial period, the Mahant acquired zamindari rights uh, for Manyari and surrounding villages and took the title of Maharaja. The monastery served as the center of zamindari and Bumihar power during the Raj. By the time I was living in this village in 2016, however, uh, the monastery functioned kind of like a, a semi-public space. Public meetings, almost like a park. Public meetings were held in the monastery complex, including meetings by the Sangatan. People freely strolled around the grounds and ponds in the mornings and evenings, and groups of laborers could even be seen smoking chillum on the very steps of the complex that was once the seat of landed power in the region. The transformation of a site of power and dominance into a quasi public space, however, is qualified by the, fact that, by the fact that the temple trust retains control of by far the largest land holding in the village. And the Bumihar relatives of the Mahant continue to exercise influence in village affairs, although in subtler and behind the scenes ways, uh, than their overt past dominance. So if there's been a sea change in everyday social and political relations in Mahant Manyari, there's been markedly less change in property relations. The gated but open grounds of the Mahant, therefore, provide an apt metaphor for the possibilities and limitations of democratic politics in rural India. All right. So let me let me uh, turn to a scene of vignette. I, I was sitting with uh, Ranjit, uh, a laborer who had become a friend, who I spent time with on most days when I was living in the village, in his hut built on land still owned by the monastery trust, and that he still referred to as God's land. He recounted the hold that the Mahant had during his childhood. Quote, he was the king. When he would emerge, seated on an elephant from the palatial monastery, the older people bowed in supplication as he passed. They were scared. It was a time of his rule, a time of bondage. Sitting with two fellow laborers in his hut one evening, Ranji described the Lalu period as the real struggle for rights that undermined the rule of the Mahant. During his government, we started sending our kids to school. He gave us voice. Bolne ke adhikar. Ranji described how people learn to apply oil to their latis to get their rights, emphasizing how the old order was undermined through a new sense of assertion amongst lower caste people that had widespread destabilizing effects. And people like Ranji gained status and new streams of income as the number of lower caste brokers multiplied, a process I've referred to elsewhere as a democratization of corruption. In addition to being a broker for government projects, Ranjit was involved in the bootleg liquor trade. 
Uh, by 2017, Ranjit had opened an illegal toddy shop on land owned by the ward by the ward member representing his tola. Well, sometimes rowdy, I always found these spaces in the village to be refreshingly cosmopolitan. Most of the male customers sitting, drinking, and talking for hours were migrants who had returned home from urban centers all over India, even places like Nepal. Men would recount stories of their travels, but discussion tended to return to the village, and they all publicly stated their intention to return for elections. One must return to votes. Vote ke liye ana hai was a common statement in the midst of constant speculation of who might run for ward member. Ranjit frequently discussed the potential feasibility of his own candidacy, despite the many hardships of being a migrant laborer. The dignity and assertion of a voice that this political talk reflected was remarkable. Sitting in the shadow of the now empty monastery that once held many of the laborers' parents and grandparents in bondage. So I think it's striking to consider how much political and social change has happened during a single generation, driven by a combination of electoral democracy and uh, economic change migration. But despite such a dramatic change for laborers in Mahant Manyari, like in villages across Bihar, now this was not a place where they could exercise their rights under Manrega in a meaningful way, despite their sense of voice and political empowerment. Why? So in order to make sense of this uh, paradox, I will ethnographically ex examine uh, a sustained effort of laborers to collectively exercise their rights under Manrega in, Man in Manhant Manyari and surrounding villages. Ranjit's hut, was, Ranjit's hut was located in a labor settlement that had been the center of organizing for Manrega Watch, that had been engaged in four years of struggle against village elites and local bureaucrats, involving protests, extended dharnas at government offices, and countless acts of everyday organizing. Manrega Watch was started in 2011 when its founder, Sanjay Sahani, um, then a full-time, now a part-time electrician in Delhi uh, with a seven standard education. And he likes to point out that he was the most educated member of the Sangatan, chanced upon fraud in Manrega and his village by looking up publicly available records online. Um, Sanjay returned to his village and eventually started a Sangatan, almost daily meetings with group of laborers, mostly Dalit women, I'll talk about this, often ran late into the night. Um, in this in the thatched roof uh, headquarters located not far from this work site. Ranjit's wife was a member of the Sangatan, and Manrega Watch banners were prominently displayed on many houses in this area of the village. It's another view of the work site. So the, so the story of the Sangatan actually starts in, in Delhi uh, with Sanjay, who's working as an electrician, uh, happened to, go, to spend a little time in a cyber cafe. It was actually his first time on the internet. And he, he had remembered a woman that he had met doing Manrega work. Um, and after spending time, who, who, who complained that she wasn't being paid, and so he, he decided to just type in, he typed in Manrega, um, resulting in, the, in the, this portal, the Manrega soft web portal coming up. Sanjay described to me a tortuous process of tunneling down the web portal from state to district, block, panchayat, navigating pages often displayed, you, know, you can see this whole website's in English, to find his, his native village. The bureaucrats and activists who regularly use this web portal have learned to navigate this labyrinth. Uh, it's clear that this was designed for officials, not citizens. And Sanjay finding online documents for his village there are secular. So the iron designed for the benefit of rural laborers being so labyrinthine was a foreshadowing of the labyrinth Sanjay was about to enter. And this beginning highlights a couple of things. One, the centrality of documents and practices of documentation for exercising economic rights and the accompanying need for non-laborer activists who possess documentary expertise to enable this. 
So just briefly, there's a contradiction of economic rights requiring documentation that illiterate people cannot possibly navigate, which as we shall see, combines with the political sphere that operates according to the logic of clientelism and with bureaucrats who expect to receive commissions, which means in the end that rights in rural Bihar can only be exercised through activism. And I think therefore economic rights should be seen as an activist project. So back to the story. Let's see. Oh, I have a photo of Sanjay. Just a minute. So Sanjay returned to the village with, he basically printed out thousands of pages of documents from, from this website, uh, from his village, and just started roaming the village with the documents, trying to verify it. And is, if, I've, I've done this myself. Anyone who's done this realizes pretty quickly that what's on paper diverges dramatically, systematically even, from what's actually happening. In particular, he finds that many laborers, especially women, uh, are listed on the muster roll and have been paid, but they have no knowledge of any of this. He repeatedly uh, kept calling a number, there's a help number on the website, and somehow he ended up connecting with uh, Nikhil Day of the MKSS in Rajasthan, who connected him with Santosh Matthew, who at the time was the principal secretary of rural development in Bihar, and who ordered a social audit to investigate the discrepancies that Sanjay discovered. So to summarize a long story, and I could go into this during the discussion, the social audit ended when the Mukia's entourage attacked Sanjay and his supporters, foreshadowing subsequent violence, uh, including the murder of a lawyer ally uh, of, of Sanjay uh, by the Mukia um, not long after. So attempts to use the transparency net mechanisms that are a key part of, of the Manrega of the act uh, were, violent, re were violently resisted by the Mukia contractors and their allies in the village, and therefore they weren't effective. But Sanjay, guided by Nikhil Day, who he actually refers to as his, his guru, uh, learned to bypass the panchayat by organizing laborers to collectively submit documents directly at the block office, right, above the village, or at the district headquarters, which is allowed in the act. Uh, getting signed and dated receipts that provide legal evidence, compelling action. The day after, the, so this is what he did. He basically organized laborers, um, prepared demand registration forms, and had them submit them at the block collectively. The day after this was first done, the police called him to the station. So you are the chief minister? Are you the Mukia? I said, no, this is Sanjay. Are you the head of Manrega? I said, no. So why are you preparing Narega forms for people? This is what the police were asking me. I think it's striking how subversive the simple and legal act of submitting demand registration forms was considered, right? Not just by the village elite, but also even by the police. I have more stories about the police, uh, maybe in the discussion. If Sanjay hadn't been connected with a high-ranking government official, these early interactions with the police, I think, would have gone quite differently, and this might have ended the story right there. But with a sympathetic principal secretary, uh, the block and district bureaucrats had no choice but to sanction the opening of, of a work site, of, of a, a few work sites initially. They were now under the management of the, they were now not under the management of the Mukia and brokers, which as we'll see is, is the normal state of affairs which generated a real rupture in the social fabric of the village because there had never been public works projects that weren't under the control of the village elite. So in order to provide a little context, I wanna just briefly, and this is another, uh, we could talk more about this in discussion, but I, I wanna talk a little bit about how Manrega works in the absence of activism. And to do this, I couldn't really do this in Muzaffarpur because I was just considered too close to the to, to Manrega watch. And so I, I did most of this work actually in, in, in Bojpur, in Koiluar, my original research area, um, where I know a lot of the brokers, actually know a lot of the Manrega brokers uh, over the years. And they, you know, so it enabled me to kind of get inside and to see how the system was actually working. So at the panchayat level, the elected Mukia or the husband of the Mukia, the Mukia Pati, 
when the post is reserved for women, uh, contractors, um, brokers basically, and ward members who are aligned with the Mukia actually design and pri prioritize projects. Although this is supposed to be the, done by the Gram Saba. And it's contractors who take on specific work projects, recruit labor, and manage day-to-day -day operations, even though this is, this is not allowed in the, in the act. Uh, according to the vision of the act and the operational guidelines, laborers registering demand for work are, all, are supposed to be the ones who actually initiate projects. But the registration of work occurs through documentation that, as in the case of the Grand Saba also, remains controlled by officials who work in collaboration with the Mukia and brokers. Let's see. There we go. can see the effect of all the reservations for women. In practice, laborers are unable to register demand and receive the stipulated receipts. And this is why unemployment allowance, which is another key aspect of, of, of the act is never paid for failing to imply, uh, provide employment. Rather it's brokers using networks of laborers that they diligently maintain uh, that who actually register demand. So I think there's a point worth restating. It's brokers who initiate projects. And so they're the ones who in practice actually generate demand uh, for work in the absence of activism. Examining the process of allocation of projects, like which projects are chosen, or what order reveals the extent to which panchayat politics revolves around the distribution of contracts, well, the business of being a contractor is dependent on one's political positioning within the panchayat, resulting in what could be termed a mukia contractor regime. Since the allocation of projects occurs through the mukia contractor regime, there's always a risk of opposition from a rival faction. This threat is intensified by the general hostility of landowners to Manrega. Since it's difficult to run projects that don't touch privately held land, especially since so many property boundaries are contested, many projects are passed over or abandoned because of the threat of what villagers refer to as litigation, the English word, which means, you know, basically, usually this means rivals of the Mukia making or even just threatening to make a formal complaint. Since the allocation and take up of project is shaped by the political dynamics of the panchayat, these dynamics become materially visible in the spatiality of Monrega works with brick paths, drains, and irrigation works mapping onto the political divisions of the village. In some cases, I even saw brick roads like stop when approaching the house of arrival of the Mukia, only to continue afterwards. So having sketched how Manrega operates in the absence of activism, I want to turn now to two themes that emerge in examining the antagonism between efforts to collectively exercise rights under Manrega and the sphere of panchayat politics. These will be gender and caste. So before I do this, so this is a, this was a meeting, this is in Bojpur. Um, and the broker is the one sitting there actually preparing all the documents. Basically the, the actual uh, Rosegar Sevak, Sevak is like sitting behind him almost like his assistant. The, 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 Mukia, the official Mukia is, is, is the woman sitting here. She only came for maybe 15 minutes, didn't speak a word, signed papers, left. Her husband, standing behind, basically was running the meeting. Um, this is a good example of how things actually worked on an everyday basis. And I have a, I've, we could talk about this in a lot more detail uh, afterwards if we have time. Oh, these are the offline. I, I figured because because uh, the official documents, you know, the actual official Manrega documents um, don't correspond to everyday practice, brokers must keep their own documentation just to keep track of what they're doing. And sure enough, I found kind of the black book of uh, one of the brokers. He allowed me to photograph it all, which was quite useful for my research. These are, we refer to them as online versus offline documents. There's also online versus offline actors. Just a brief summary of how the paperwork is managed.
Well, most of the initial laborers involved with Manrega Watch were men. Over time, their activity decreased as the uncertainties of payment and the degree of resistance fa faced became clear. As men dropped out, their female relatives joined. Manrega Wallas, the term used by non labor villagers to refer to Manrega Watch activists, I was also called a Manrega Walla, uh, became mostly women. Sustained struggle in the face of intense resistance from both village elites and bureaucrats progressively subalternized the movement, most strikingly in terms of gender. This subalternization was structural. Only women laborers in Mahant Banyari, it turns out, were willing to engage in sustained struggle for the right to do manual labor for 168 rupees per day. This dynamic intensifies the self-selecting design of Manrega that is central to the logic of an employment guarantee. When the provision of work under an employment guarantee is rationed, but fairly distributed, it makes sense that people most marginalized within local labor markets would drive demand. Manrega Watch membership is entirely driven by the willingness to engage in collective struggle for the ability to perform manual labor for a very minimum wage. As such, the most important determinant is one's relative is one's position relative to labor markets. The case of Manrega Watch demonstrates the ways in which exercising rights based on class position can have profound implications for gender relations. What could be what could be termed the contagion effects of rights activism? The, ex the collective exercise of the right to work had a rupturing effect within the social fabric of the village, precisely because most people normally engage with bureaucracy through gendered, caste-based, and brokered patronage networks. And so just to give a one example, I encountered this often stark dynamic of uh, the gender dynamics of Manrega Watch activism during one of my first visits to Amruk, a village near Mahant Manyari, where many laborers had been organized by Manrega Watch. I'd gone to meet Chandan Devi in front of her simple house and asked her and the 10 other women present about the Sangatan. Her husband and a group of around 15 male laborers were also present. And the conversation evolved into a heated debate between the group of women and the group of men. Amrak, was, it's an interesting site for this, uh, as the head men later, the Mukia later opened a work site to compete with a work site managed by Manrega Watch, resulting in two distinct villages, two distinct systems of Manrega practiced in the village. And this is actually fairly typical in many villages. The men pragmatically argue that it was better to obtain work through a broker because then they would be paid at the end of the day. Who would wait for months to get paid, one man asked. In contrast, the women's argument was ethical. Manrega work was their right and their struggle was just. Chandan Devi asked how many of the men get 100 days of work per year, as stipulated in the act. Since no one received 100 days, this meant their rights were being stolen and they should fight in order to prevent this from happening. A common theme in activist discourse describes rights violations as theft from the household. This was a particularly public version of debate I heard from both men and women. For the women taking part in the debate, their valuation of activism and the Sangatan clearly went beyond the payment of stipulated wages. Struggle was a value, Larai, was a value in itself, endowing them with influence and a new status acquired by openly opposing the village elite. But almost all the women also acknowledged that given the uncertainties of payment through Manrega, it made sense for their husbands to work as daily laborers to ensure that basic household expenses could be met on a daily basis. Male laborers are much more involved in the public sphere of the village and especially the politics. Some of the husbands of Manrega Watch members, including actually Chandan Devi's husband, were considered to be neighborhood uh, netas or low level uh, tikadars with relationships with more influential leaders outside their area of the village. Many male laborers did not want to forego the potential benefits that politically connected people could provide them in the future, including access to credit, help in dealing with the police, work on public projects, uh, the receipt of a range of other government provided assistance and possibly also work on private land or non-agricultural private employment. 
During the countless hours that I spent sitting in tea shops in labor areas of Mahant Manyari and surrounding villages, and in huts that served as semi-private social spaces, there were often neighborhood leaders, brokers, netas present. So the sphere of electoral politics penetrates deeply into everyday male sociality. But women are largely excluded from these spaces. Even though Manrego Watch members are mostly low, low caste women, mostly Dalit women, everyday activist discourse did not articulate caste and gender identities with the identity of being a laborer. Although the overwhelming majority of Manrego Watch members were women, and basically after Sanjay, all the, the top kind of second tier of leadership were all women, you know, like caste that I'll talk about in, in a moment, there were a few slogans emphasizing women's empowerment. There are really no slogans. We can later discuss uh, you know, the contradictions of a man leading an organization that ended up being overwhelmingly uh, made up of women. I found it striking that while the increased public assertiveness, assertiveness of women laborers was perhaps the most widely discussed and visible effects of Monrego Watch activism, there was almost no explicit mention of gender during Monrego Watch meetings. Gender-related issues were only discussed, in fact, when male relatives attempted to prevent women activists from participating, or when, as happened occasionally, malicious rumors were spread about women activists' virtue. Many of the husbands of Monrego Watch members felt that loss of control over their wives and the public ridicule that they received from other men wasn't worth the unpredictable financial benefits to the households to their household from their wives' activities. Well, conf well household conflict over Monrego Watch time, their husbands did come around to accepting their involvement once they saw like there, there were some financial benefits that they received. Well, the practical effect of right to work activism was to empower women vis-a-vis -vis the village elite and within their household because suddenly they had money that they controlled. an effect that was intensely debated by villagers. This was only discussed during meetings as a practical matter, during activist meetings as a practical matter when opposition threatened labor unity, Mazdur Ekta, which is one of the activist themes. It was one of the central themes. After one heated meeting that I attended, women activists collectively confronted a male panchayat member, threatening to beat him with their sandals if he didn't stop spreading rumors, questioning the virtue of female Monrego Watch members. But when I heard a similar statement from upper and middle caste farmers and reported this to a large group of activists during a meeting, it was laughed off. So it was only when it threatened like labor unity uh, amongst laborers that it was, it was an issue. Issues of domestic violence similarly became important only when husbands were preventing or punishing women for participating in Sangatan activities. So overall, I mean, just to sum up, I mean, th this really taught me the extent to which the remarkably consistent exclusion of women from public life in rural Bihar that I've observed over the years, despite such dramatic political change and 50% reservations for women in patriot institutions, it endures with such stubbornness because it's a form of class oppression that I think is a central feature of agrarian class relations. And I think it needs to be analyzed as such. This explains how organizing exclusively around the identity of being Mazdur had perhaps the primary effect of empowering women. But let me turn now to caste. The rights activism formula of class struggle directed against bureaucracy has both clear advantages and disadvantages. The method of organizing against bureaucracy based on the identity, identity of being a laborer carved out a social space in Mahant Manyari, insulated, even if precariously, from the caste, patronage, and political relations that shape public village life. The importance of maintaining this space was reflected in the near daily meetings uh, that would often last deep into the night. Sometimes they would last all night. The activist focus on labor unity, Mazdurekta, 
in opposition to bureaucracy enabled alliances that would have been otherwise difficult to maintain. For instance, the Sahani caste in Manyari, which is an EBC caste, includes both landed groups, uh, including the Mukia, and many laborers who are Sangatan members. And even amongst Dalits, caste differences were always a potential source of discord. For many of the more supportive husbands of female Manrega Watch members, their involvement, like the ones who actually were involved, um, it was less, I felt sometimes, this was less about empowerment for them than demonstrating the independence of their family and caste from the Mukia. In other words, instead of being a means to empowerment, they saw Manrega Watch as a demonstration of power gained through electoral politics. But focusing on class instead of caste or gender enabled them to support a multi-caste movement spearheaded in most villages by women, and in this village by, uh, by his wife. So, I mean, an employment guarantee basically isolates um, isolates uh, class interest of those marginalized within labor markets. In doing so, a potential for collective action based on this class interest is set in motion. Organizing around Manrega, therefore, builds upon a structural form of class articulated through law. And I argue that this is what distinguishes activism around economic rights like Manrega from other forms of activism. This is also why labor unions such as Manrega Watch are necessary for exercising these economic rights. Being a labor was the only identity that I heard emphasized during Sangathan meetings. Most mentions of caste that I overheard, for instance, were during informal conversations, not during the actual meetings. Sanjay, for example, stated several times to me that he didn't know the, the caste of Manrega Watch members, despite the fact that the growth of the Sangathan clearly was occurring through caste and kin networks. During meetings, in fact, the only time I heard caste explicitly mentioned was when caste-based disputes between laborers threatened labor unity. For instance, Sanjay had not attended the National Association of People's Movements convention that I attended in, in Patna in 2016 with other Manrega Watch activists because he had to deal with the conflict that erupted between laborers and Mahant Manyari. This is the site where this happened. The urgency reflected what Sanjay described to me as a threat to the unity of the Sangathan in the place where it was the most consolidated. Several times he expressed to me his worry that if labor unity was ever fractured in Mahant Manyari, Manrega Watch would collapse. I happened to be present at this work site when the fight broke out. And as far as I could discern, it, the dispute was between two groups. One group was led by Mandeshwari Devi uh, and Hindu Devi, both who were both core members of Manrega Watch and Chamars by caste. And the other was a large group of Paswan laborers. The root of the conflict was a disagreement about how much work each group should perform each day. Mandeshwari Devi, insisted that everyone work until they had completed enough to demand full payment or for the work to be divided into two parts with separate measurements. Hindu Devi was particularly upset, shouting that they had spent two and a half months being eaten by mosquitoes at the Dharna that resulted in this work site being open. We could talk about this. Well, the other group was rarely present at the protest site. If full payment was not made, she stressed, they would be forced to do another Dharna and the burden would once again be on the core members. The employment officer, the Rosgar Sevak, seated on a plastic chair in the middle of the worksite to take attendance and ensure sufficient work had been performed was visibly, visibly anxious as the two groups shouted at each other. And he repeatedly asked for everyone to settle down and stay as one group. This incident was a particularly dramatic instance of a constant threat to labor unity, conflict between laborers along caste and political lines. And in fact, the word Rajniti was almost always used by activists to describe politically shaped caste division that they, viewed, that they viewed as an existential threat to their project. In this case, there were rumors that the local ward member, 
a Paswan caste leader who owned the land upon which uh, Ranjit's illicit Tari saloon operated that I talked about earlier, was attempting to exacerbate the tension. The fact that not all Manrega Watch members participated equally in the prolonged protest required to force the Manrega bureaucracy to open new work sites and pay full wages raised an inevitable freeloader problem, as did the work site itself. Sanjay focused on this issue intensely for around a week, holding several meetings. And these were the only meetings I actually wasn't allowed to attend or record, uh, but the tensions did eventually resolve. So, but, you know, the way that activists get by the, get, get, get past this is by, if they can maintain labor unity, they bypass the political sphere by submitting documents directly at the block, engaging directly with bureaucracy. This. But even when following the letter of the law and with the support of senior officials, there was still a need for civil disobedience to exercise rights in a sustained way. I spent three weeks, for instance, at a dharna in front of the district headquarters that lasted nearly two months before this worksite and a few others were open. So I don't have time to do this point justice here, but perhaps we can discuss it later. But I think the paradoxical need for civil disobedience to exercise legal rights reveals the extent to which the subversion of law isn't only a local problem. The Bihar government and Nitish Kumar himself have been openly hostile to Manrega. He's told me that himself. In this context, it's important to remember that no government in Bihar has been able to pass tenancy reform. Lalu wasn't, Nitish wasn't. So in short, a combination of a state government unable to or unwilling to disturb class relations in a significant way, bureaucrats who demand commissions, and opposition from political actors and landlords in the village combine to render law unimplementable. Let's return to this initial, the paradox I started with of laborers experiencing such a sense of voice and political empowerment over recent decades, accompanied by their inability to exercise basic legal rights under Manrega. And this holds, by the way, for other socioeconomic rights, um, such as the right to food under the PDS, uh, which is, was also a sustained Manrega Watch campaign that we could, we could discuss. It's quite interesting. The people who have the most interest in exercising their rights under Manrega suffer from interrelated structural constraints, being embedded within patriarchal social relations, the constrained movement and voice, belonging to marginalized castes, being illiterate, and the dull compulsions of economic life that so often inhibits activism among, among, amongst the poor. Strengthening the employment guarantee, say by bringing stipulated wages in line with local labor markets, would dramatically expand interest in working on Manrega work sites and being involved with activist efforts. I observed this dynamic during India's bizarre experiment with demonetization in 2006, 2016, uh, through a collapse of labor markets and not an expanded employment guarantee. With no work locally or, or in migration destinations, I saw many more male laborers at work sites in Mahant Manyari. And the ambivalence about Manrega and Manrega Watch that some of my male laborer friends frequently expressed notably softened. So I think we can only imagine what would happen if India's employment guarantee were strengthened and actualized. Um, but the case of Manrega Watch and other Sangatans like Manrega Watch across India provides a glimpse of what is possible. At activist run work sites, officials actually show up to record attendance. Laborers, mostly Dalit women, work without the mediation and despite the fear opposition, the fierce opposition of local politicians and patrons. I often felt that the possibility that labor organizing could I often felt that the, the possibility that labor organizing could spread rapidly, a perception shared by other activists and I suspect by fearful bureaucrats and politicians. And at times this did occur. I mean, there were times when there would just be this steady stream of, of laborers coming to Mahant Manyari to, to fill out uh, demand registration forms from all over the district, even other districts. 
An awareness and belief of this potentiality was a central motivation for the activists. Activist-led work sites served as very public demonstrations that Manrega could be implemented as designed, that Manrega is not inherently unimplementable, that, a get, that an employment guarantee is possible. But the problem is that the political sphere at the village, regional, and state levels prevents laborers from exercising their current rights, much less a meaningful extension of these rights. Sanjay Sahani succinctly dis expressed the divergence between rights and electoral democracy during a meeting in Atola in Mahant Manyari. As he put it, quote, the Mukia is the Mukia, the Sarpanch is the Sarpanch, and the Sangatan is the Sangatan. If the Mukia did good work, if the Sarpanch did good work, the Sangatan would not be necessary. We give our vote to receive our rights through our representatives doing their work properly. When this doesn't happen, out of compulsion, we unite and form a sangatan because this is how everyone can collectively fight to take their rights. Because if one person fights, she won't be able to take her rights. But if 20 people meet, strength is created. And by struggling with this sangatan, rights can be taken. So elective representatives in the sangatan are totally different, end quote. But just in conclusion, the, the case of Manrego Watch taught me the extent to which the sphere of electoral politics not only conceals class relations, which is something I had learned in my earlier work uh, by examining particularly the heterogeneous class composition of Yadav political identity in my original research village in Bojpur, a little chapter on this in my book, but that the sphere of electoral politics actively resists and subverts collective action based on class identity. Spending many hours in labor settlements not focusing for this research on electoral politics, I learned the importance of the identity of being a laborer, of, of being mazdur in everyday village social life. Uh, that to be honest, I, I think I neglected this a bit in, in my earlier work. But as soon as this class identity was used as a basis for collective action, it was seen by elites as a profound threat to the status quo. So let me just conclude with two provocations, just for discussion, to open up for discussion. Does this tension between rights and the political sphere in part explain the success of India's democracy? Perhaps landed elites have acquired, have required the hegemony of the sphere of electoral politics, especially at the panchayat level. Because if law was implemented according to the logic of rights and not clientelism, this would be a larger threat to their economic interests, despite the profound caste-based political change of recent decades. So is there an implicit class compromise that underpins the entire democratization process? And second, uh, you know, referring to more recent political developments, uh, John Harris and Stuart Corbridge analyzed the rise of Hindutva as a, quote, elite revolt. Building on this insight, you know, we consider that maybe elites had little choice but to work within and co-opt, ultimately, the sphere of electoral politics since subverting the hegemony of electoral politics and replacing it with the rule of law would actually profoundly undermine their interests, explaining the kind of populist form that this revolt has taken in recent years. So I will end with that. Thank you, Jeffrey. Sure. This is dinner time in India and you have given enough food for thought. <laughs> there, are, there are three discussions. Um, I, have, I was thinking many things. Um, I had a project but from the Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India for Mandrega evaluation. It was actually through the Institute. And I, I was remembering my work. We had chosen three districts, Baksar, Samastipur, and Munger, and some sites there. So we'll talk about that later, if time permits. We have three discussions um, from various backgrounds. We will first start, actually, I'll introduce all the three, and then we'll start with uh, Rajesh Suriji. And, and we also have senior people here. Professor Anand Kumar is waiting. He will share his reflections. And then we have Professor Sachitanan Sinha, Professor Binod Khadria, 
and uh, Professor Chansekar Bhatt. So uh, yeah, we'll talk, but let me just uh, quickly introduce the three discussions here today. First is um, Rajasri Ji, who is a 2011 batch Jharkhand Kader IS officer. She'll be, uh, she's, she's in news for the amazing work she's doing as Manrega Commissioner and Director Panchayati Raj in Jharkhand since July 2021. You will have, uh, you know, many things to learn from her. She's applauded by a lot of people, um, you know, uh, and she has ensured maximum participation of women and members of SC and ST Gram Sava in the employment campaign. Under her leadership, Jharkhand top the country in the matter of providing timely remuneration to Manrega workers. She is known for her remarkable administrative skills and applauded for managing, say, for instance, Savan Mela. And when she was in, um, I think, Ramgarh district, Ramgarh was de declared open defecation free ODF. She's originally from Mysore, Karnataka, uh, and uh, she's taken degrees in political science. We're so happy to have her here. Let me also introduce Santoshji and Alicia so that, uh, you know, one after the other, the theme is maintained and each one of them can take, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, seven to nine minutes. Uh, Santoshji is a senior journalist working with the Indian Express in Patna. More, more than two decades of experience, and he has worked with several reputed newspapers, including the Asian Age, the Statesman in uh, Delhi, Bhopal, Telegraph in Patna. He has trained himself with remarkable achievements. He did his master's from the Asian College of Journalism, Bangalore, and has backed many awards, such as KC Kulis International Award for Excellence in Print Journalism, the Statesman Ruler Reporting Award in 2010, Express Excellence Award in 2012, Press Council of India Award for Developmental Journalism in 2013 and the Red Ink Award in 2018. He has brought out the Srijan Scam from Bhagalpur, the Mujapurpur Shelter Abuse Case was part of his investigative stories. He has also taught as Makhanlal Chaturvedi National University uh, in Journalism and Communication and also at Amity University in Patna. His books like Ruled or Misruled, The Story and Destiny of Bihar, and the most recent, recent book, JP to BJP, which is, which is catching up, uh, is, is, is very famous. So uh, he'll share his own insights. Uh, there will be plenty of things to, to chew. And then we have Dr. Alicia. She's with the Sustainability Science Program at Harvard Kennedy School. You know her. Um, is, is, she's one of the emerging scholar uh, that I know. Uh, she has completed studies in uh, public policy from Harvard Kennedy School of Government, her PhD in 2018. She has had several fellowships, Switzer Fellowship, Goldberg Fellowship in Global Food System, uh, you know, uh, and uh, Fulbright Scholarship, Sustainability Science Fellowship in 2014. Um, and, and I find a commonality in something that, I, that I've been doing myself uh, she's interested in exploring the role of various institutions, which uh, either saves and creates bottlenecks uh, in, in the path of development. Um, her research interest also lies in knowing the consequences of inequality and maldistribution of power on developmental pathways. So uh, let, let us open and let us first go to Rajeshwari Ji. So over to you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for having me on this panel. And uh, thank you, Dr. Aditya, for the very warm and very kind introduction, especially after the bureaucrat bashing session of Mr. Jeffrey, who uh, I think has put it out there in words that uh, you know bureaucrats are always on the lookout for that 25% commission and you know whatever, whatever. So uh, it's. Uh, uh, I think uh, something that I cannot really much comment on because uh, the whole uh, uh, context was, uh, I think, in the context of uh, Mandrega Bihar. And I don't know, um, uh, I don't have the full document in hand whether um, uh, the allegations of, you know, this commission and the involvement of bureaucrats in actually uh, weakening the uh, system uh, uh, you know, has been a, a well-researched uh, uh, study, uh, and these 
these are facts based on the empirical data. Uh, these are some things that I think I would uh, have to look at before actually commenting on the scenario that has been you know just uh, shared. But definitely that was an eye-opening session and uh, we cannot ignore the fact that uh, in the local levels, especially in rural India, the, the dynamics of class, the dynamics of gender, these all play a part in the way the system delivers to the common man. Uh, and and uh, as a bureaucrat, I think that is a challenge we all face. And um, I don't know how much uh, difference is there between the implementation of the scheme in uh, Bihar and in Jharkhand. But from Jharkhand's uh, perspective, I can say that uh, the participation of women is something that we have been uh, uh, you know, strongly focused on, as Dr. Aditya said. Uh, just yesterday, we had the Rosgar Mahadivas organized uh, all over Jharkhand. In most of these areas where uh, uh, the, the Narega schemes uh, have not been doing well, and I do have a report of that, uh, of uh, those events held yesterday. Of course, these are subject to a little more verification because this was just done yesterday and the report has gotten compiled today. But uh, in the 24 districts of Jharkhand and in these uh, 4,099 4, panchayats where the uh, Rosgar Mahadivas was organized, uh, there were 1 lakh 9,588 households which have demanded for employment. And uh, out of these, uh, the, the number of women who demanded for employment stands at nearly 60,000. See, this, so this, is, this was all generated in the one-day program that we held yesterday. And this was uh, the whole program. We are actually having an abhyan going for Narega. And the whole abhyan was, has been um, envisaged looking into the data available with us through MIS, we have identified uh, the worst performing blocks uh, on three parameters. And these three parameters is overall reduction in the generation of employment, in the generation of uh, person days, uh, reduction in the participation of SC and ST communities in uh, Narega, and also reduction of women participation in uh, Narega. So these were the three parameters that we identified and we identified the blocks that have seen the uh, highest reduction and we came out with 50 blocks in each of the categories and of course we have combined many more things related to Narega like Aadhaar uh, issues, bank issues, bank account issues, uh, delay payment issues, etc. etc. So, so this is quite a, a major abhyan going on in the state. Uh, uh, I think uh, one thing that I would uh, note from my experience, which has been quite short, I've joined uh, like three months ago, uh, but my experience has been uh, that definitely I think uh, there is an issue of awareness among the rural population, awareness among the laborers. They are not aware of the whole procedures. They're not aware of the whole processes of how to go about to get a job card, who do they go to, and uh, uh, what are the kind of documents that need to be given? Where do they go? Where is the bank? Who do they approach uh, when they do when they have something that is related to you know some banking work? Uh, so so definitely there is a general tendency among the rural population to kind of go to a person who can do that easily for them. I think if people were aware and if they knew uh, about everything, then definitely there is no need for a middleman in the whole process. We have to understand that the process, there has to be a process to do something. It's it's not that we just work in uh, you know uh, a very simplistic way. That cannot happen because we are working on a very massive scale. Uh, uh, if you talk about Jharkhand, we have around 40 lakh job card holders. Out of these 40 lakh job card holders, around 50, around I think say 45 percent, around 20 to 22 lakh are actively working in Narega. Around 20 lakh, 22 lakh have taken work this year. Out of those many, around there are around 5,000 to 5,500 households who have gotten 100 days of employment in this financial year. So we are working uh, on a very large scale, and we are having nearly 3 lakh, 4 lakh schemes that are ongoing. Uh, every day there are thousands of new schemes that are being implemented in field. So definitely I think it is a challenge for us to be there uh, uh, 
for each of these areas. So, so to that that gap uh, is not being filled by us. That is something we definitely need to look into. But as long as that those gaps are there, then the people will look towards somebody who can probably help them help them get the job done. And this is not just in Narega. We have seen that even say to get a ration card, people will go to the person who knows everything, who knows where to go, who knows the processes. Uh, so, so this is seen more or less in all areas and more or less in every scheme. So to, to kind of uh, mitigate these gaps, there are now some of these um, new trends coming out in Narega, for example, uh, the recent uh, invention being this uh, NMMS app. This app is a real-time monitoring of the site where the Yojana is going on, where the scheme is going on. There is the mate who will go and upload the attendance on the spot. It is to be done real-time. So this is a new intervention that is being done by the government at the central government level, and we have taken it up. Uh, very keenly to implement this because this is probably one way to how we can curb the you know the fake muster rules the ghost laborers working and wrong payments etc cetera, etc cetera. so so i think the problems are always going to be there now this is something we cater to there's going to be another problem the next day so then we come out with a solution there are always people who will try to work on you know getting uh, with malafide intentions to see how they can tweak the system, how they can utilize the loopholes for their own gains. Uh, so, so, uh, so definitely, I think it's a very complicated uh, uh, yojana with a lot of things going on and in a lot of places. So, so uh, definitely, bureaucrats are there to monitor and to see that things are being done well. But if you count the number of bureaucrats in a district, for uh, you know, for forty lakh job card holders, there is only one Manrega commissioner. So uh, there is one commissioner at the state and you have a small team of say 12, 15 people at the state. And then when you go to the district, uh, uh, there is one video in the block, probably some ways there are, there is a CEO so that there, that is two uh, bureaucrats per block and maybe one or two to as, as the assisting staff. Uh, other than that, mostly you're working with the technical staff who are the BPOs, who are the computer operators, the JEs mostly who are local people so so i think uh, the, the the to break uh, the nexus between the middlemen and the staff and the, and the uh, other uh, people who are actively involved uh, in the system is not going to be easy uh, because uh, because that is the scale at which manrega is happening is huge and uh, 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 I think when we when we uh, it, it, we go back to the same question: Who will guard the guardians? What is that foolproof system that we can come up with, where everybody's needs are catered to, where every problem is uh, having a solution? That's that's not going to happen. I mean, uh, it's a system that is evolving. There are going to be these problems, and there will be solutions to these problems. Uh, and I have a very interesting story. I was a collector till recent times and when I was just making rounds to one of the villagers and uh, basically checking out this uh, solar uh, water supply scheme that was newly installed in one of the villages. It was being done by the welfare department and a very nice uh, solar based uh, water tank was constructed and uh, with taps so that people could e easily you know do their uh, uh, daily routine washing and bathing and all those things near that tank when i went and visited i saw, I saw that there was a, a lot of garbage there the cover of these soaps and detergents and plastic and all those things so uh, as soon as we reached a couple of people gathered and um, we got to talking and most of them were ladies we got to talking and then i asked them why is this kachra here you know why this garbage here why don't you guys clean it up why don't you clean it up and then there was one female who said, Ki, nahi, we do it. And then I said, why didn't you continue to do it? Why don't you all just get together and do it? You know, they, why wait for the government to do it all the time? So she, says, she was like, nahi, nahi, why should we only do it all the time? Even other people should come and do it. And that was a, uh, th that was a village. It was a village which, uh, with uh, mostly um, same community people. They were all STs, uh, a, tradu uh, a tribal-dominated uh, uh, village. So she said, Ki, why should we do it all the time? 
and uh, then you could see a lot of bickering was happening and they were speaking amongst each other, each other in their own santali language which uh, i couldn't understand that then there was one uh, person who came and told me ki ma'am basically it is the uh, chavi ki ladai hai you know it is the fight for the key the key which opens the door to that tank and which will on that solar pump everybody wants control of that key and it is a fight for the key so so I, this was an interesting takeaway for me because an asset which was created for the community by the government you know kind of divided the community because some you know there were people who wanted power on that asset because once you have that power once you have that control then you have control on the community you have control on the people near you so so i think uh, it, it's it's a very complicated scenario uh, where uh, a lot of people are involved the government is involved stakeholders are involved and i have a lot of such interesting stories where there are times when people forget what class they belong to they forget what community they belong to Uh, my odf experience in ramgad has shown me that if there is a social cause in which there is political will and administrative will and the will of the people then definitely the minds will come together i have seen uh, we used to have ratri chopals because government was very uh, you know um, open to giving toilets to anybody and everybody who demanded for a toilet and even though they were being sanctioned they were not being made in the field so it was the job of the administrator of the collector to motivate the people to build these toilets so how do we motivate so we came out of with all these unique ideas ki ratri chopal you go in the night and sit with the public and so we selected one of these panchayats which is quite far from the headquarter not very good roads we reached around 9 and uh, to my surprise there were more than 1000 people waiting it was dark and there were these uh, halogen lights by the block administration and in the middle in the in the late evening around 8:30 to 9 to see a gathering of 1000 plus people in which nearly 60% were women they were females they were waiting what is the collector going to come and talk about and they were there throughout they were there till 10:30 and uh, i think these are the takeaways that i have taken from the field that if there is a cause and if we are able to convince them that that is uh, the right thing to do then definitely they do come together and uh, i think um, uh, it's going to take time it is not there's never going to be that perfect system uh, we have to understand that a lot of stakeholders are involved not only are people divided by caste religion or community they are also divided by aspirations there is somebody who is aspiring for more there is somebody who's who doesn't care he's happy with what he has so when he doesn't care and he doesn't involve himself somebody is going to make misuse of his right we need to understand that and we need to understand that we are not uh, we will uh, we are not working in a very mechanical setup of course it's a system which is made of laws which is made of rules which is made of a lot of things but it is being implemented by humans it is being implemented for humans and by humans and humans cannot work mechanically everybody has their own i mean definitely i um, i cannot say for all bureaucrats but there are many bureaucrats who want to make a genuine difference and they do happen maybe not at a very large level maybe not very visible but that also happens in the system so so uh, i think that's what i take away from this um, activism versus democracy democracy uh, uh, there is no dearth of activism in india that is something that i am i can you know i'm 100% sure of i almost on a, uh, every second or third day i have a group of these people coming i have people from mazdoor manch coming and meeting me there are the nagrik seva kendras uh, the the civil society is quite active in jharkhand so so i think uh, we have a lot of positive stuff to look at uh, in the story of narega in jharkhand and uh, uh, and i am all for activism if it is for the right cause and if it is something that the government needs to do if it is something that the administration has to take care of then definitely their voice will be heard that is uh, i think what i can say as an administrator 
so so thank you um, uh, uh, mr jeffrey for the very uh, enriching uh, presentation and uh, the panel for inviting me uh, i wish i could uh, speak more and give more time but i think there are a lot of uh, more uh, topics to discuss so we'll keep it for some other day uh, thanks again to everybody and all the best thank you thank you so much for um, for sharing your thoughts and i think this is what um, we were aspiring for we we could have got some bureaucrat from bihar but we thought we will get the star who is trying to make sure then what uh, narega means and how it should be implemented so let's hear santosh ji now santosh bhai sir uh, it's it's your turn now over to you uh, thank you dr aditya raj uh, let me first uh, thank uh, professor anand kumar and mr jeffrey witso i have been uh, huge admirer of both gentlemen Uh, Jeffrey, I read your Democracy Against Development, and you gave a very interesting perspective of caste dynamics, pre-colonial and post-colonial. So how you explain caste? It's wonderful. Uh, I authored two books, but I just wondered I should have read the book first, your book first. Wonder, wonderfully written, and of course, Professor Anand Kumar. Uh, we have uh, grown up uh, listening to him. Uh, his body work, body of work is terrific. He's the one he who has worked with Jay Prakash Narayan. I have a devoted chapter on in my book. Uh, I wish I could have spoken to him, but I am writing my uh, next book on Kapoor Thakur. Surely I will speak to him. Now uh, he talked about Professor Anand Kumar talked about three landmarks. The first landmarks he talked about the JP movement, of course, the which we call called Bihar movement, and again he then he talked about internal colonialism and then the identity and interest politics i just want to add uh, excellent i just want to add the contextualized vision of politics begin in 1967 when we have sbd government sambit sarkar was formed and when lohia and golwarkar came together that was the first time we had the contextualized in politics and then we had another landmark in 1977, when we have Janata Party government, and of course it fructified in 1990 when, of course, in Bihar, Lalu Prasad came, which he talked about the 1990 identity politics, the phase of identity politics. Uh, on Jeffrey's remark, very interesting, uh, intense research work. I have nothing to add to uh, his uh, case studies. He has given his great case studies in his book as well. i think his works on manrega is also very i think expensive what i would like to add as a roving reporter I, because i gather my perspective all my information from the field i i do not set any extra which we call yarn we gather from we pick the pieces from the ground and i consider myself more a reporter than a reporter i just take the luggage and unload the piece of information in black and white a uh, very interesting story about sanjay sahani jeff you talked about in muzaffarpur we and uh, he also contested election uh, <laughs> 2020 election uh, jean drees even came for his campaigning so many candidates <laughs> also came okay we knew then in caste ridden bihar he was not going to win but at least a manrega activist a manrega and manrega activist contested in election that itself is a achievement how much how many votes he got that is immaterial but what what is happening to manrega workers you gave us a detailed analysis of what is happening all the nitty gritty but what i am going to say uh, just last year i think after the first pandemic i came across a story from baksar where an rti activist we uh, just protected his identity in the story and again i am here again i am not going to reveal his identity he just uh, he used to file rti information on manrega and also he exposed so many people who had got manrega job cards in the name of students school is school going students you know the manrega job job card fraud it's rampant then again you talked about the uh, muscle of mukhyas some people got after his teenage son at teenage son 
he was returning after writing his last paper of class 10 to board and uh, he was picked up uh, arrested by the police and wrong case was wasted and top of it he was put up in a major jail not in a minor rehabilitation center or the farm center when we came to know about his father was running from pillar to post when we got the story we published the story touched after the story i think uh, the court also took notice and he was released but this is not one of case in 2013 we have an activist who was gang raped and even murder even it seems uh, when the since the rti act came into being 21 activist have been murdered so far nitish kumar government has been talking about speedy trial where is the speedy trial in such cases there is no conviction in either of the 20 cases why so when you try to talk about rights activism it has been there but it doesn't get the adequate support of the government i i know an rti activist sri prakash rai he from nagrik adhikar manch he from baksar he comes to patna every second day either he is at the high court patna high court or at suchna bhavan information at hartali board and either he, he has filed some thousand rti first appeal second appeal and he didn't get desired information and he his life is also at threat i just i i have just noted noted down some cases case studies i just talked about jean reed and jean reed also came for campaigning say he of course came to bihar several times about ramp he campaigned against rampant corruption in in manrega scheme and uh, you talked about jeff nikhil day nikhil day was also, also there in two th- in 2018 itself six people had been murdered six rta activists had been murdered only 2018 and in in sanjay's village only uh, an advocate advocate was killed advocate kum rta activist was killed recently in motihari an rta activist killed because he exposed land mafia so when you talk about right activism it about the exposure of manrega fraud pds scheme public distribution system scheme mainly these these two things again and you talked about the dominance of mukhya and also i am very happy you have stayed in bihar for a long time and uh, you have got uh, i think you speak hindi very well and <laughs> i have heard several stories about you <laughs> we can talk talk about that later <laughs> mukhya pati and sarpanch pati these are the two coinages which have after the first turn of nitish kumar which came to exist and you come across any village the best house in the village has to be of mukhya how come everybody knows it's a it's a rampant corruption and he he has his set of people his supporters my question is when you make a manrega job card why can't there be a third party survey as a journalist i find it very difficult if discretionary from on the part of mukhya if if he, somebody is apl even he has job card there are several several stories and such repetitive story do not come even our newspaper said okay we have carried this story this shows the extent extent of problem we have so similar with the case of food activism and my colleague uh, dipankar ghosh i think last year before just before bihar election it did a story on midday meal scheme midday meal just in absence of distribution of midday absence of a closure of midday meal scheme because of the closure of scheme a uh, closure of schools no midday meal was being distributed so some students from the poor section of society turned rag pickers we did a story after that story the patna high court took so much to action then the bihar government started distributing grains instead of food midday meal scheme so there has been a story of uh, food activism uh, rights activism in different forms or other other but i think uh, there has to be a sup- there has to be support there has to be a support system not just of civil society 
part of the government, whether I'm just not blaming one government, a successive government, rights activism is a very, I think, what I, what I should say, uh, it's in passing through a very difficult phase. I don't, do not know the history, and you would know about the, its ethnography, uh, of course. But what I have tracked Bihar in the last 15 years, uh, the case is, uh, the story of rights activism is very dis dismal, especially of uh, RT, RTI activists about the Mandrega study. And I would also, before I forget, I would also like to add the post-pandemic post story. Some uh, 50 lakh estimated, 50 lakh people returned to Bihar after the first pandemic itself. Government, Bihar government did skill mapping of some 20 lakh people. And they also, central government announced that there would be jobs. Some Pradhan Mandir Rojgar Kalyan scheme was announced. But what was the problem? The state was not going to retain them for a long time. 170 rupees for Mandrega. A payment after 22 days, 23 days, it was not on. If they work in a rice mill in Telangana, they get some 700, 800 per day. Where is the retention? Yes, we talk about the guarantee. Okay, women folk are employed. That's great. But I think, number one, deserving people must get Manrega card. Number two, minimum wage has to be fixed. Whether it is 300, 400, even in open market, it's 350. In even in Patna, you, you do not get a lever for less than 400 rupees. How can you retain them? Where is the mechanism? You talk about you have not created jobs. You have so so much in so so much in the state. You have makhana, you have tomato, you have potato, you have banana. So so many things. Not a single industry has come up in the last 15 years. Our government, our chief minister has been still talking about Vijili Sarathun Pani. Basic is what that he has provided. When I often say, when we when a comparison would be drawn, the Dr. Sri Krishna Singh will be would be always at the top as as achiever as achieving chief minister because of all the good works he had done. And for social empowerment, Kapri Thakur would also score over the present incumbent chief minister. Okay, Vijili Sarathun Pani is done, but what about? employment generation, and everything is interlinked. Then we we have a very isolated story of uh, likes of Sanjay Sahani or for that matter, uh, Sri Prakash Rai. So we have to take the story forward. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for your work. Uh, keep coming to Vihar. Next time you come to Vihar, we'll definitely meet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's Alicia's turn. Alicia, you can come in now, please. Over to Hi. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great uh, to be here. I, I accepted uh, Aditya's invitation, uh, mostly just to be able to engage with people uh, from Bihar because it's this pandemic has created also a long time since I've been able to go. And also I first met Jeff when I started working in Bihar and his scholarship has been uh, really influential on my own thinking. Uh, so it was really nice to be able to hear uh, what uh, he's working on right now. And I, I think we met at Cafe Coffee Day uh, a long time ago, but right at the beginning of this uh, of this project looking at Enrega. Uh, so it's really nice to hear where it's gone. Um, at the same time, coming from a public policy school and a public policy background, I feel in some ways profoundly underqualified uh, to comment on such beautiful anthropological uh, deep research uh, into into Enrega. Uh, my my own, I love anthropology, but I'm always looking for sort of what is the policy implication? What is the policy implication of uh, what what? What anthropologists do, and thus uh, maybe don't even do justice to the true weight of, 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 of the arguments that are being made. Um, but that said, I, I will comment on this from sort of what are the implications um, for, for public policy anyways. Um, and I think this whole discussion has been really interesting, looking at this tension between what bureaucrats want to get done and even bureaucrats that have a 
you know, come into the, the, their profession with a profound sense of duty and the need, this need for activism to get anything really done that promotes equity. And my own scholarship is, on, is, is within the field of sustainability science. Um, and I work on, well, what does it really take in practice uh, for governments or for NGOs or for businesses to really promote sustainability over the long run? Um, and I talk about a set of six capacities that are necessary to promote sustainability. I won't go into them in detail here, but one is measurement, the capacity to measure. Another is to adapt and transform, but really critical to this all is the capacity to promote equity. So there's this question of, well, how do we promote equity um, at the local level between countries? There are, you know, within the United States right now, uh, our own pandemic has shown just how deeply inequality is impacting uh, the social cohesion of our country, our ability to keep kids in school and that kind of thing. So I'm interested in Jeff's work from this question of, well, what can his scholarship tell us about what it takes to promote equity? Um, and in this case, study of uh, Inrega and Bihar. Um, and I guess what, what struck me, uh, first, a lot of it aligned with my own work in Bihar, which, which shows that in many of the agriculture technology schemes that are targeted at the poorest farmers, say the poorest quintile of farmers, rarely actually end up benefiting from those technologies. Most schemes are co-opted by, you know, not wealthy, but wealthier farmers in the village. Um, it, it was, uh, if you actually go and you look at the records for drip irrigation and who's received drip irrigation, just like uh, Jeff looked at the records for who had actually received in Rega, um, you'll find that the records are actually very good. If you go to a site where you believe there should be drip irrigation, there is, but that's because drip irrigation largely only benefits wealthier farmers. And so the, the bureaucracy kind of works out there. Um, so I wondered a lot as I as I listened to Jeff, what what are the larger implications if if you're going you know if, if if you're talking to a big donor or to a government official and you're saying well first how did Enrico work in in Bihar in terms of promoting equity in terms of its ability to promote equity um, and how can we make it better and it seemed to me that the the first lesson we really garner uh, from this ethnography is that sort of with any institutional legal rights-based policy to promote equity, one, the, the, there's lots of unexpected outcomes and the devil is in the details, but you can write a policy on paper that looks really exciting. Globally, there's a tension. Oh my goodness, this right to labor is going to transform things. And then when it gets on the ground, everything kind of works out differently. And I think, you know, you have this other strand of scholarship saying, okay, at least in Bihar and Rega hasn't worked out. There hasn't been a lot of promotion of equity, for lack of a better way of saying it, through this. But I wonder if that's actually true. Thinking about sort of different ways of analyzing power and especially what sort of what kept coming back to me as, as Jeff spoke was uh, was uh, John Gavinta's three dimensions of power, which talks, he talks about the need to sort of, or the three ways that powerful people suppress uh, disempowered people, including uh, sort of coercion, but also exclusion or institutional power, keeping the oppressed out of situations by institutionally uh, excluding them, and then, of course, influence. But also then the flip side of that is how activists or how activism happens and where does activism come from? And it seemed to me that this Enriga policy actually gave a site for activism. And I think this is largely what Jeff's work is about is, well, it has not worked out the way kind of you know, the people that wrote in Riga on the first on, on the first day wanted it to, but it still has created this incredible site for activism that is actually leading to a place for empowerment. And without this site for like this, I mean, it's not a physical site necessarily, except where people create a physical site around it, but it gives uh, it gives uh, disempowered members of society, in this case, uh, in this case, uh, lower caste women, the ability to find something uh, to uh, that they have the right to activist around. Uh, and I think that's really important when we think about sort of the long durée view of what uh, public policy can do to promote equity. Um, so what that means for me is that, yay, we need more of this. 
it's not working out exactly. And that bureaucrats that sort of have the have the heart have their hearts in the right place um, and want Enrega to work out for the betterment of the poorest, the most marginalized, really uh, need to also understand how important activism is to uh, things uh, moving in the direction they want to. And of course, you know, I understand if someone criticizes sort of my work, it, it also, you want to sort of, uh, you want to defend it, but uh, I think more of a, finding a place where there can be more of a, of a unity between bureaucrats and, and activists um, would help uh, moving forward. So that's my very public policy take on Jeff's incredibly uh, detailed ethnography. Um, but it's really great to be here and I look forward to continued discussion. Great, thank you very much. Isn't it exciting? So, uh, you know, uh, we could have had our senior scholars uh, share their insights, but since we started late to accommodate uh, Jeffrey and Alicia Yu, so Professor Anand Kumar had to leave, Professor Binod Khadria left, so some of them left. But um, Jeff, if, can you take a look? There's a question there by one of our um, scholar. Uh, maybe I can ask him to unmute and, and ask. Uh, so after that, uh, we will we'll share our reflections. Uh, and um, Dr. Papi would also like to say a few things. Birind, can you, can you unmute and ask your question briefly? And if there is any other question, please let us know in the chat box. Birind, Birind Bujel. Uh, Birind is my student. Uh, he's, he's working on the Na Nepali diaspora. Birind, okay, let me read your question for, for Jeffrey. Um, so he's asking, since your work is based on ethnographic study in which often the researchers are accused of being ethnocentric. So it's more about the method and therefore the interface of research is also, uh, also believed to be not free from epistemological violence. Oh, so please uh, share us with your experience of not being influenced by ethnocentrism <laughs> and staying away from committing um, you know, uh, knowledge producing violence. <laughs> so, Jeffrey, you can, uh, you can, um, you know, you have got the view of a bureaucrat, a journalist, a student here, and, and Alicia, of course, from public policy domain. Um, so, you, you can, um, you know, give us a rebuttal on this? Yeah. Sure, yeah, I'll try to, I'll try to be brief. Thanks. Excellent, uh, excellent comments from everyone. In terms of, you know, trying not to do uh, epistemological violence, um, I guess I follow, but this work was interesting because all you know, my previous work, I I tried to remain as neutral as possible, which is impossible. In strikes, I was in a village that was very divided, and I was constantly moving between different groups. Um, and being an outsider had certain advantages in that in that kind of context. Um, this work was quite different because I couldn't be like that. And so I kind of followed a tradition in, in the anthropology of human rights where you have to choose sides. And so, yeah, I support, I supported the Sangatan. I'm, I'm going to support Dalit women trying to exercise their rights under Manrega. It's kind of like a, a choice, right? So I guess that's how I deal with that. <laughs> um, I don't know if that answers the question. Um, start from the end from Alicia. I think, yeah, yeah. You summarized a lot of my points. Uh, one of the things that, that activists, often told me laborers like Mandeshwari Devi, she would say, you know, when I would say like how hard you're struggling and how little you're getting, what's it all about? Why, why continue to do this? And she kept saying, is Manrega worthless? And she'd say, no, without the law, there's no struggle. Without the law, there is no struggle and there's no hope without struggle. And so, you know, th and this is, this wasn't just like, I think the architects of Manrega knew this particularly people like Jean Dres, I mean, he's explicitly stated that this, it creates a potential for collective action and that's the only way that it can possibly work. Um, and to, you know, to, to, to go back to uh, Rajesh Radeji and, and, you know, I didn't mean to bash bureaucrats as a whole because this project from the beginning of Manrega, uh, activist bureaucrats have been absolutely central. It's impossible actually without sympathetic bureaucrats. So it's more that there's a division. I mean, a lot of what that happens in this type of activism is different parts of government are opposed to each other. 
And that's how change happens. And sympathetic bureaucrats are absolutely central from the beginning, from the formulation of the law to, to, to the implementation. For example, I mean, when there has been a sympathetic DM versus a hostile DM uh, in Muzaffarpur, huge, huge difference. Even the program officer, like just a sea change. If, when there's been like a hostile program officer versus a sympathetic one, and I've seen both, um, huge, huge difference. And so, no, I mean, sympathetic bureaucrats are, are absolutely uh, essential, but I do think we have to question a lot of the data as, as you also pointed out, Alicia. And, and, and that's where I think activists are also useful because they can tell you what's actually happening. And kind of, you know, you have the official data, this is how many women are working, but how many actually? There, you need a way to actually have a sense of that. Um, I don't think awareness, just spreading awareness in and of itself is a solution because of kind of the reasons I've been detailing. There was a there was a World Bank study in, in Bihar on Manrega where they showed it was a randomized controlled trial where they showed informational videos uh, to people, to laborers, and then you know tried to see the effects right uh, of this on on Manrega outcomes. And what they found was that yeah people's awareness increased, but it didn't translate into any additional work. And I, I, I read this study and then I actually told this study, I, I, I described the study to Mandeshwari Devi, uh, one of the labor activists in, in Mazafarpur. And when I explained the study to her, she's like, of course it didn't do anything because there was no struggle. That awareness in and of itself doesn't do anything. You have, cause it, it's not like people just don't know about it. There's, there's, there's actors subverting uh, their ability to exercise rights and so, knowledge has to be combined with with practice with action with struggle um and so yeah i, I guess i can end there San, uh, santosh i mean thanks for your comments um yeah it was very interesting sanjay's uh uh running in the election it was also interesting because i mean in in with the pandemic i mean there was this huge you know the stranded worker kind of crisis which he was actually a huge part. There was this organization, SWAN, the Stranded Workers Action Network, which got international media attention actually, and, and which basically was, he was the focal point of that. And so, and, and I think he tried to use that to expand his kind of appeal, uh, particularly to the male laborers. But even despite this, despite tens of thousands of members, he, 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 he couldn't even come close to winning the election. To me, that highlighted even more strongly this division between rights and the electoral sphere and how difficult it is to bridge that divide um so yeah so i guess and and the last thing i mean you were saying the the wage you know for yeah, is 350 rupees but that's not the wage for women for women it can be as low as 100 rupees and that's why that's why that's why even at the low rate it's still the actual demand for employment under Manrega, the genuine demand, if, if, if it was actually able to be actualized, is still massive, even at this very low rate, which is, is well below the market for, for male labor. And so I want yeah. to thank all of you. That was an you know, excellent discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. There has been so many things discussed. You know, as I was telling you, when I, when I first moved in here in 2010, in 11, I... I got a project from Ministry of Rural Development. It, it was through the institutes. All the IITs and the IMs were made, uh, you know, as part of NIN, National Institutional Network, to monitor some of these programs like uh, Janini Suraksha Yojana and Manrega. And um, I was doing for Bihar. Um, so very, very interesting things. Uh, did I complete the project? Uh, yeah, a few steps. And then somehow I got the completion certificate and I was, I was sort of... Uh, uh, done with it and moved. So um, thank you very much. We'll keep talking. It's getting late. Um, I'll invite Dr. Papia to come in and you know say some reflections and do the closer. Uh, Dr. Papia is the PI of the project under which we started this lecture series. Um, I'm only part of it. So thank you, Dr. Papia. Unmute yourself.
Okay. Audible now? No, Dr. Papia is having a little difficulty. Like nevertheless, I just couldn't, uh, uh, you know, stop myself from adding my share of it. So when uh, Professor Anand Kumar started with talking about the politics of interest and the identity politics, it kind of set the stage uh, to which uh, Jeffrey's work added uh, with the examples, you know, that kind of brings this uh, uh, issues in a more nuanced manner at the grassroots level. And what I most enjoyed, Jeffrey, about your uh, presentation, your uh, talk was the coining of the term democratization of corruption. You know, whenever we try to evaluate any of the policies, what we see is that it is just not the lack of awareness, as you rightly mentioned, people are quite aware, they said they are jagrup, you know, and what is more important is access to the resources and access to knowledge. There is a totally a disjuncture between knowledge creation and knowledge dissemination. And that's where we see there is a gap between the practitioners and the researchers. You know, from when we look at the field from a researcher's point of view, we see that these things are not getting implemented. And uh, the way you brought out the subtlety of the caste dimension, of the gender dimension, and it fits very well within a project where we actually talk about gender empowerment, you know, and also uh, your examples allowed us to um, understand the irony of uh, the service providers uh, creation and how uh, the service users are utilizing it from the example of the web portal that they design that at times it is so Uh, so at times, you know, uh, there is a difference uh, between uh, this kind of uh, uh, the, from the service providers point of view and the service users point of view. So when Rajeshwariji brought out uh, this, uh, uh, the concept of the ghost laborers, especially in case of Narega and why the brokers are given so much of importance, it is generally like if we try to bridge this gap, I think we'll be able to overcome some of these issues. And Alicia pointed out about the question of equity, that how we need to address uh, the concept of equity. And uh, Santoshi gave a very uh, relevant examples from the field where he talked about the midday meal schemes and how, you know, some of the schemes are not getting implemented so in order to bridge this gap between knowledge creation knowledge dissemination so that we are able to provide a platform and the way this knowledge is created by the service users the service providers are able to gain the maximum out of it and that's where you know your con jeffrey you very well uh, kind of place your concept of activism like why do they need to do this activism just to kind of bridge uh, this gap so that kind of brings us uh, to the development uh, debate uh, so in, in a country like India, where we boast of having one of the largest population in the world, and yet you look at some of this ratio, whether it is in terms of Narega, as you said, and Rajeshwariji are also kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, affirmed to it, that there are so very few people who are trying to implement it, and there are so many beneficiaries. So this is a skewed ratio between the service providers and the service users, whether it is Narega, whether it is in terms of school education, there's a ratio of teacher and students you see. In the healthcare sector, you see the ratio between doctor and, uh, you know, doctor-patient ratio, hospital bed uh, ratio. So I think this kind of brings us to kind of sit back and rethink that when we are talking about development, are we just talking about meeting certain targets or what should we focus on? Should it be focused on creating the human capital, which is the base of any development discourse that we want to carry on, or just, you know, meeting the numbers and uh, hitting the bullseye that we have finished the target? And how different are we from the corporate world, which have a target board, and they just want to 
maintain profit maximization. So I think we need to kind of differentiate this and uh, that kind of will allow us to engage in more debates in future. But as we have, uh, you know, crossed the time limit, so I'd like to thank all of you uh, for taking out your time and sharing with us your valuable insights, our uh, participants, our organizing team, and of course, uh, my spouse and faculty colleague, Dr. Aditya, who always meticulously uh, does this job very good. So thank you to everybody. Have a good day in the United States and a good uh, So Dr. Aditya, would you like to just share about the next lecture? So now we have come to this close and Tomorrow, you know, tomorrow we go to my constituency um, to vote because there's by-election. And next weekend on Saturday, we have Professor Irida Rajan Sebastian talking to us about migration crisis. We'll have Professor Binod Khadria as for, for inaugural note. And um, we have Puspendraji, TISS, uh, TISS Patna, and then we have Sudesh Nair to bring an important gender dimensions. So thank you very much. Have a good day, Jeffrey uh, in, and Alicia and everybody. Good night. Until we meet. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I leave now? Thank you, Santos. Bye, Thank you.